Thank you very much, Kathy. That was, it, it was a wonderful introduction. Uh, you've brought together such a wonderful group to, uh, to discuss. So thank you for all you did to make this happen. And also thanks to the Klaus Center um, for sponsoring us today. Um, it's just about two weeks ago, it was on October 9th, that Turkey crossed an international boundary into Syria. This is the kind of work that I focus on most of the time. Um, the United States protested what was happening, told Turkey not to do too much, not to kill too many people while they were um, uh, invading Syria. But our president said absolutely nothing about <coughs> international law and that this was, in fact, a violation of international law. In my view and what I've written about it, it was, that it was an act of aggression, the most serious kind of violation of law that happens, period. If law exists as the antithesis of violence, as an alternative means of organizing societies without using coercive means against each other, then to organize your major military with the state-of-the-art firepower that both Russia and the United States have made available to uh, Turkey, and for them to pay no attention to the fundamental law on when it is ever acceptable to kill masses of people, destroy the built and natural environment, then we don't have a lot of respect for the rule of law. Our president said nothing about that basic rule. The Turks, by the way, did send a letter to the Security Council in which they set out what their legal argument was. That was a nice technical compliance with international law. The UN Charter in Article 51 says that if a state is exercising emergency self-defense, it must notify the Security Council. So they actually sent a letter. The least important thing that you can do in the law on self-defense, they did. Unfortunately, the letter did not actually cite the only grounds by which a state is justified in using major military force on the territory of another state, and that's in self-defense if an armed attack occurs. Turkey said, we're worried that in the future, these are, this is almost word for word what Turkey said in its letter, in the future we might face more terrorist attacks from the Kurds. So it was a preemptive war against terrorist organizations, which in my view are criminal organizations, not the type of groups that can actually trigger the Article 51 self-defense. I work on these kinds of questions all the time. I have my whole career. I am a Roman Catholic, and for me, uh, struggling against violence and against war is, is part of my vocation. And I've always felt since my childhood during the Vietnam War that international law was the best means that we human beings had to uh, bring a sense of legal order and prohibition to uh, mass violence known as, as war. But over the years that I have been studying this problem and trying to bring some voice to making it more honored, making it more respected, it seems to be going in the opposite direction. We seem to have less and less compunction about killing, certainly killing with military force. And what I seem to see happening at the same time, when the president can order a drone strike in another part of the world on a mere suspicion that somebody might in the future organize a terrorist attack or recruit somebody to carry out an attack, if our presidents have no sense of legal restraint on that sort of action, then why would they have any sort of legal constraint on authorizing excessive violence within the country? Or to use a more current example, to say that if Congress issues a subpoena, it has no legal value. We see that uh, disrespect for the law abroad is migrating back to all of our societies. We're hearing discussions about the decline of democracy the need to reinstitute um, a sense of respect for our governing institutions, I think that all comes down to a declining respect for the rule of law, for the respect for legal principle um, in, in our day and age. So I, I tried to think what attracts people, what would get people to think more about the value of law in our very materialist 
age in which we're thinking so much about ourselves and what we can get out of society. Um, so I actually just began to ask people, and you know, I could ask any one of you, why do you obey the law? And we've all been so indoctrinated into the answer to avoid punishment. Isn't that the first thing that came into your heads? <laughs> if I said to you, Dean Rougeau, uh, <laughs> even Dean Rougeau, who's uh, 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 well, um, he's thought about all these issues. That's the first thing he would say. It's not your fault, <laughs> Vince. It's 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 the way we've been indoctrinated, or um, probably. Dean Rougeau, because he also teaches contract law, would also say, well, and of course there's advantages to obeying the law. I can get a house built if I make a contract with a builder. So I can get some advantages, I can avoid punishment, these are the two reasons. And uh, we have these reasons in international law, and we've actually done a fair amount of work, I think, on helping people see that this area of law, which is in declining uh, presence, certainly within the United States, as this country has become more and more militarily and economically powerful, we are less interested in the law of the world. But still, um, some of the great uh, scholars of international law have thought a lot about this problem. So Lewis Hankin, um, my professor at Columbia Law School and one of the towering figures in 20th century international law in the United States. He's considered the father of international human, the teaching of international human rights law. He wrote a book in 1969 um, during the Vietnam War to try to make a case for international law against the rising thinking of realist political scientists who had no time for international law, quite the opposite. They thought it was a dangerous concept that would restrain the United States and what it needed to do in the world, which was to project military power. So Professor Hankin wrote a book called How Nations Behave. And How Nations Behave is a wonderful book. It's really become the classic that most of us say, why would anyone obey international law, let alone any other kind of law? And he makes the case for the advantages, the benefits of obeying international law. He's got all the great examples. Well, you don't want to be flying your airplanes from one country to another unless you've got some sense of rules because, of course, they'll all bump into each other and crash. There's, and he talks about um, trade tr treaties and trade relationships. He talks about the power and importance of diplomatic immunity and, and diplomatic law, all closely reciprocal rights. In other words, people get these advantages, but, of course, you could have these areas without real law, since you'd always get something in exchange for it. You can't get diplomatic immunity for your diplomats if you're not willing to offer it. So that kind of rolls on its own. It, those are not the hard cases. They're attractive cases, and they've been helpful in the argument over time. But they sort of led us in international law down a wrong path in explaining why anyone should obey a rule like the prohibition on the use of force. In fact, at, at Harvard, um, some of Charles's colleagues wrote several books trying to extol international law as law without sanctions. That there really was no coercive means for um, enforcing international law, and you didn't need it. So uh, Roger Fisher, do you remember his book, Charles, uh, Improving Compliance with International Law? It was all about how you needed clearer rules, kind of a, an aesthetic approach, which was helpful, too but nothing about the sanctions of international law, the reasons that Dean Rougeau obeys the law. So uh, his, his colleagues, um, Abram Shays and Antonia Shays, wrote a book called The New Sovereignty, and they said the same thing. We really can do international law without coercion, which is kind of a beautiful thing, but in fact, I think it was a fundamentally wrong approach. Because the distinguishing feature between law and other kinds of social rules and moral rules is that law is open to coercive enforcement. The distinguishing feature, the one area where we allow the society to bring us coercive power to bear is to enforce the law. Every rule of law is open, it is enforceable, even if it's not actually enforced 
and that's the, that's the case with the vast majority of law violations, they're not enforced. But they are all enforceable. And you have to have some means of coercion to uh, actually say that this is a system of law. So I, I wrote my uh, book that Kathy mentioned, The Power and Purpose of International Law, to explain that while there's a lot of natural attraction to complying with international law through these reciprocal benefits that we all gain from the system, it also has means of enforcement and counts as a true legal system. Comparable to, if and not in some ways I think better, than most national legal systems. There is a means of enforcing every rule. So the power and purpose of international law is to explain the enforcement mechanisms and why enforcement and coercion, punishment um, of rule violations is essential in all law, including international law. Um, that was 10 years ago, and I just have not seen this massive return to compliance with international law, <laughs> having figured out that, in fact, you need some coercion. And I began to think about this being a pretty puny set of reasons to obey the law. And also, I was getting more and more concerned by the amount of attention and movement toward uh, law and economics that was absorbing why anyone would do law in, I think, not a very healthy way. Even at Notre Dame Law School, uh, uh, which is a Catholic law school like Boston College, we have increasing numbers, I suppose, the dominant theoretical orientation toward law is through the lens of law and economics. And that's basically that, the, that benefit idea that we only will do law and we'll only comply with law if we get something out of it, if there's a benefit for me. And this I find a particularly unhelpful and even a dangerous way of thinking about law, that you have to get something out of it. And so in other words, if it comes to the point where it's unlikely the law will be enforced against you and you're not getting any benefit out of it, then why bother doing it? This is a real problem for international law. Think about climate change. There's almost no way that the United States can be forcibly brought into a greenhouse gas reduction regime that is painful and costly to us. There's no economic benefit, certainly not in the lifetime of any of our national leaders. So we don't do it. How do you convince Donald Trump to rejoin the Paris Agreement? By the way, we are still bound until November 8th. To 2020, but he's not complying. How do you get him to comply? He doesn't see the benefit to the U.S., and nobody's going to force him. There's got to be a third reason, especially for the powerful military countries, the U.S., U.K., Israel, Russia. They have to have a, I guess we have to add Turkey now. They have to have a reason beyond benefit and coercive detriment. And there's only one other reason we ever told anyone to obey the law, especially in that third category of cases, because it's the right thing. You do, sometimes you obey the law even when it costs you, even when it's not going to be enforced because it helps someone else, purely someone else. And reading Kathy Caveney's book, Law's Virtue, I came to realize that this was a great teaching in theology. There was this thing, of course, the father of international law talks about this, Hugo Grotius in his great book, uh, The Law of War and Peace, that we do the hard things in law, we comply with law because of divine command, because it's what God wants. But we no longer speak those terms in our law classes. I think Charles Fried gets closest in his book, Contract as Promise, when he says that the reason we should obey our promises is based on morality. He has, that is the moral basis of our promises, not because we're going to definitely get something, and that's the example he uses. Why would you obey your contract promise if you're not going to get a benefit from it? Why would you obey your contract promise if the party on the other side can't take you to court and force you in to comply. Because your promises are morally obligated, divine command. 
where we don't talk about divine command anymore. And in international law, that language from Grotius and others is very hard to do because it's a Christian language. And international law seeks to be, it must be, the law for every faith, for every philosophical and ethical orientation. It has to be our common ground. Um, and I try to think of how, what other ways we have to that common ground that would be compatible with religion because we don't want to lose what has become a tradition, but a tradition that I believe is fast fading. How could we renew this idea of divine command that's doing the right thing to build up what has become an instinct, but no longer a full-fledged argument for, for being altruistic, for doing even sacrifice wholly for the other? And the one argument, the one thing that I think we all do purely for out, without self-interest is the contemplation of beauty. This is what all of the great philosophers have told us. We know from Plato through Hannah Arendt that people react, that people are drawn and attracted to beauty. The one thing that people will express joy, they will get out of themselves, they will stop their self-centeredness, they will stop thinking about what am I getting out of this situation. In those moments of transcendent pleasure in contemplation of the beautiful. And in fact, some theologians are attracting people back to religious faith through aesthetics, and some people are understanding that this has always been the way to think about religion. The prophet said, God is beauty. My colleague Cyril O'Regan at Notre Dame, a theologian, wrote, and this was probably the greatest of the inspiration pieces for this book, that a theology without beauty is unpersuasive. So law without beauty, law that requires sacrifice, is unpersuasive. And I've tried to express through aesthetic philosophy how we can rejoin to law beyond the material reasons of pain avoidance and uh, advantage, a wholly altruistic orientation that I think we can begin to teach again to our students in all kinds of ways. So I'll conclude with just a, a, a one word about one of the chapters I enjoyed writing most of all in the book that I think has the most tangible, concrete ways to bring people into a new way of thinking about law. A substitution or a supplement for the idea of divine command. And that idea is um, that we can begin to talk about our procedures of law, our dispute resolution mechanisms, courts, arbitral tribunals, using the language and the ideas of theater this form of beauty, this form of art, instead of doing what we do now, which is totally on the material linguistic basis. We talk about going to court as going to war. We war game it. We have murder boards. The, those are, we, we win and lose it, zero sum. You are a loser, I am a winner. When in fact, courts can be the great theaters as the Greeks told us. We can all be involved. There need be no zero sum. We can assess everything on the basis of how, what was the quality of the performance? What were even the losers able to say to get their point across, even if the judges side for most of the points with someone else? So that's my hope to renew the law, and I can't wait to hear what other people think of this, I'm afraid, radical idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, <clears throat> We're gonna sit. yeah, okay. why not? Uh, I'd like to start with a little passage from Kant. Uh, idea of universal, uh, the, uh, a cosm from a cos universal history from a cosmopolitan point of view. And uh, read the passage. Man is an animal, 
If it lives among others of its kind, it requires a master. For he certainly abuses his freedom with respect to other men, and although as a reasonable, reasonable being he wishes to have a law which limits the freedom of all, his selfish animal impulses tempt him, where possible, to exempt himself from them. He thus requires a master who will break his will and force him to obey a will that is universally valid, under which each can be free. But whence does he get this master? Only from the human race. But then the master is himself an animal and needs a master. Let him begin it as he will. It is not to be seen how he can produce, procure a magistracy which can maintain public justice and is not to be seen how he can procure, uh, and which is itself procure uh, public justice, uh, which is just, uh, how we, uh, I'm sorry, got tangled up here, public, and which is itself just, whether it be a single person or a group of several elected persons. For each of them will always abuse his freedom if he has none above him to exercise force in accord with the laws. The highest master should be just in himself and yet a man. This task is therefore the hardest of all. Indeed, its complete solution is impossible. For from such crooked timber as man is made of, nothing perfectly straight can be built. That is the last problem to be solved and follows also from this. It requires that there be a correct, correct conception of a possible constitution, great experience gained in many paths of life, and far beyond these, a good will ready to accept such a constitution. Three such things are very hard, and if they are ever to be found together, it will be very late and after many vain attempts. Well, so that for Kant was the most difficult problem of all. And in fact, as his thought developed, this was written in uh, 1784, uh, within about 10 years, he had given up and he had gone to a treaty system. The best thing would be if uh, all the nations simply uh, out of self-interest uh, went into treaties and obeyed in the same way that, uh, that Hobbes says we obey contracts because we're really afraid that if we don't, others won't obey us. That picture. Uh, well, I think Kant did not anticipate the role of courts and of constitutional law. Neither did Locke, for that matter, or Montesquieu. Uh, really, the notion of constitutional law and of courts enforcing constitutional law is an American invention uh, with legs. Uh, the judges at best, oh, I, I say with legs, I mean it's now, since the Second World War, been followed more or less well all over the place, uh, very beautifully in Canada, very beautifully uh, in Germany, very beautifully in South Africa, uh, they're struggling with it in Great Britain. Uh, it's an, as I say, it's an idea with legs. Uh, it assumes the existence of judges who have a fealty to law, the notion of law. This, in a way, they are a, an example of Hegel's universal class. Uh, Hegel thought the bureaucracy was the universal class, but maybe it's the judges. Now, that is 
what, if anything, will save us. The universal class of law, of judges, and uh, the uh, idea, and I've put it up on the board, Keats, uh, and this connects with Mary Ellen's point. In Ode to a Grecian Urn, he, f he ends, beauty is truth, truth is beauty, that is all you need to know on earth, and all, that is all you need to know on earth, and all you need to know. Well, uh, how does that work with justice? I have Disraeli to bring into it. Disraeli says, <clears throat> justice is truth in action. So by the laws of logic, if, if justice is truth and truth is beauty, then uh, justice is beauty. You see, I mean, that, uh, that A, B, C, it works. Um, <laughs> no. Now, well, Professor O'Connell gets there, gets to these, because she is a believer in natural law. Well, what is your natural law? What is it that she is a believer in, uh, besides her religious faith? Uh, universality, equality, humanity, rational humanity. Qu quoting Philip Allot as she does, the ancient idea of the, of the essential uni unity of humanity. Now, beauty uh, is a kind of reason beyond instrumental reason. It is the perceived harmony which uh, Lauderpack, uh, Mary Ellen quotes frequently, involves the attainment of peace. I think that is not sufficient. I would say harmony, which is an aesthetic value, it goes beyond peace, because after all, harmony and peace can be found in silence, the, uh, the harmony of the graveyard. Harmony is cooperation. It is creative. It is not just uh, above conflict, Language is the bedrock manifestation of harmony, uh, of cooperation, just as the Tower of Babel is the iconic example of what happens when truth breaks down, when language is not possible. And it, it's, a, it's really quite a simple idea that if language were not uh, by and large, and usually, and as a default, connected with truth, it would fail. It would simply fail, and if it failed, we would fail. That's what the uh, parable of the town, t Tower of Babel illustrates. Uh, now, uh, Mary Ellen, on pages 17 and 18, says, aesthetic philosophy is, an, is a secular alternative to the religious elements of traditional natural law. Uh, I am less convinced by Hannah Arendt, uh, whom she quotes, than by Keats, that truth is beauty, beauty is truth, and then Disraeli, and of course justice is truth in action. Uh, the emphasis on the disinterested pleasure in beauty is very similar to the notion of justice and the disinterested uh, uh, dis stances which Mary Ellen was talking about. Aquinas talks about beauty as proportion, integrity, and clarity. Uh, but these are outcomes that depend on truth. Truth is coherence and the possibility of coordination. Without truth, truth in language, truth as the basic assumption of our lives together, we have the Tower of Babel and we fail. Now, 
A nice example of this is in John Rawls's uh, theory of justice, not parts one and two, which everybody reads, but part three, where he talks about the good of justice, where he talks about how what analytically has been put forward as a kind of impersonal uh, way of producing good outcomes becomes an intrinsic value in itself and not instrumental at all. Uh, the same thought is brought about by Rawls's student, Thomas Nagel, when he writes about the possibility of altruism. Uh, and this leads to law and the possibility of rational adjudication. It's a great honor um, to be here with these great legal minds um, and experts in international law. And thank you to Kathleen and to Professor O'Connell for bringing this all together. Um, it's a little daunting to be up here. I feel like Yoko Ono sitting in on the Supreme Court right now. <laughs> right now, um, and speaking after Charles. Uh, whose wife Anne taught me English in high school and was probably the most uh, brilliant and intimidating teacher I ever had. Um, so I feel like I'm at the outer banks of my, inter maybe at the outer banks of my interdisciplinary relevance. Um, because what I don't know about international law could, could fill a boat. Um, so today I'm going to try and stay in my lane as an artist and educator. Um, I am neither a philosopher nor even an art historian. I'm just a mere mortal visual artist practitioner. Um, and I'm reminded here of the great abstract expressionist Barnett Newman, who once famously said that aesthetics is to the artist as ornithology is to the birds. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to first discuss a few artist and activist initiatives which seem to resonate with a number of the key points that Professor O'Connell makes regarding the challenges of international dispute resolution and the possibility for aesthetic philosophy and really humanity's shared experience of beauty in nature and in art, even though those, those are really different, uh, to offer a path of reanimating international law. I'm going to try to make some links between the habit of law and the habit of art, and I'd love for you to talk more about the habit of law um, later, because I found that really engaging. Um, as a way of make of being that might allow kind of a pivot away from the use of force, a sort of Kleinemann, to borrow a Harold Bloom word, a swerve of atoms so as to make change possible. Um, I, I read the book. I learned so much uh, <laughs> uh, reading reading this book, and and um, and a lot of things that were incredibly distressing too that I had not known about uh, the, the the Chinese destruction of the coral reefs. Um, uh, so and even though I'd studied a lot on on Kosovo too, I mean I found that whole section just really really edifying and illuminating. Thank you. Um, in her elegant section entitled "Natural Law and Beauty," Professor. Um, McConnell describes how since antiquity, philosophers have used the universal experience of taking pleasure from art or contemplating beauty to illustrate that people are not only motivated to act in their self-interest. Ask any living artist and you will quickly find that this is particularly true when it comes to economic self-interest. I myself bear the scars of many deep self-inflected financial wounds made to realize projects that I'd hoped would create experiences of beauty but had no guarantee of commercial or critical success. Um, this is the first one. I, this one was probably my biggest bankruptcy, which was um, <laughs> which was uh, creating a live flower installation at the uh, Institute of Contemporary Art in, in Boston that was up for, for two months. And um, sort of halfway through, I ran through their piddly $1,500 stipend and was forced to like, sell the only valuable thing I had at that time, which were my grandmother's golf, silver golf trophies, uh, to keep the, the, the flower installation um, going. Um, there are thousands of artists and curators uh, and arts and cultural organizations all over the world who are actively making works of art, 
which creates those shared experiences and sense of commonality, which Professor O'Connell and uh, Philip Alot, is that how you say his name? Yep. Hope are the inspiration to find justice. Um, the ability to care about others beyond ourselves with no promise of gain or avoidance of pain is the daily bread of artists like Doris Salcedo, uh, who's a fantastic Colombian artist who has spent the last 30 years really making extraordinary experiences, extraordinary shared experiences to create um, material acts of mourning and remembrance. Um, this piece here, uh, called For November 6th and 7th, was made on the 17th anniversary of the 1985 attack on the Supreme Court of Columbia, in which members um, of a Marxist guerrilla group took, took, uh, marched into the Palace of Justice in Bogota and held the Supreme Court hostage um, later in the day, um, after a military raid, the incident left almost half of the 25 Supreme Court justices dead. Salcedo created this haunting piece by lowering all of these chairs, these empty chairs, on an electronic pulley system, each representing a victim from the building's roof, which came, they came silently and then they disappeared silently. And something I didn't really explore in my remarks, though, but is the, the place, I mean, this is a very wordy group, you're all great with words, but uh, I traffic largely in mute images, and what is the role of, of silence in truth um, is something I'd like to, to think about. Um, uh, a few other quick artists, I mean, Jay, I don't know how many of you know Jay R., but, you know, which is the pseudonym of a French photographer and artist whose identity is completely unconfirmed. And he fly posts these really large white photographic images in public locations. And he started by making these gigantic photographs of French kids from poor housing projects uh, on urban buildings. And the work really challenges the reductive images of, of advertising. Um, and it's really not about selling or profit or winning. Um, so this one, uh, he was invited by the Armory Show, and it's a line of immigrants. Um, the Armory Show is like the biggest, fanciest art show in New York. Um, uh, so it's an archival image of Ellis Island, um, but updated with Syrians' portraits that J.R. took when he was at the Zatari refugee camp. Um, this is another a gigantic piece that he did. Um, and it was uh, installed on the Mexican side of the border between the United States and Mexico in 2017. And Jay organized uh, a, a gigantic picnic on both sides of the fence. Mm -hmm. um, and the eyes in there are of a dreamer called Kikito. And people mm -hmm. gathered around the eyes of, of this dreamer, uh, eating the same food and sharing the same water and enjoying the same music. And one part, half the band was on one side and half the band was on the other side. Um, the artists may be selfish people, um, but the art encounter is not about winning. Um, there is no space for domination or cutthroat competition in aesthetic pleasure. Uh, aesthetic pleasure, beauty, does not work on a scarcity model. Just because I experience art doesn't mean you can't experience art. Beauty doesn't go away just because one person has had a profound encounter. There are plenty of experiences of beauty to go around, and almost everyone has access to the disinterested pleasure of a sunrise. Art of all kinds, not just street art, like the ones I've shown, supplies that, quote, common non-competitive bond with others, as described in the art of law. And by the way, I see this in my, in my classroom. I mean, BC students really want to get ahead. They really want to get a job. They really, you know, now to my dismay, we just found out that something like 1,900 of our undergraduate at BC are economics majors. Um, this year we're at our lowest point in studio art, which is seven. Um, and, but one of the things that amazed me last year, um, this notion of, no, was a student actually said, the thing I liked about this class so much is I could give away my X-Acto knives or books to other students in the class. I would never do that in another class because um, I would think that they would be getting an unfair advantage over me. But in, in art, there is no unfair advantage in being generous. Um, so I wanted to show that this lack of personal advantage or profit can, can also be seen in the work of Extinction Rebellion 
which is a global environmental movement which uses nonviolent civil actions, and some are sort of classic civil actions of disobedience, but some are much more in the realm of theater and performance art. And they use these actions to compel governments to address climate change, eco-devastation, and the loss of biodiversity. So this is the <laughs> Extinction Rebellion's um, logo, which as you can see, they really want, they disseminate it to anybody. The only rule is you can't profit from it. Um, if you go on to their, um, it's, it's based on the hourglass um, inside of a, of a warning that time is rapidly running out. If you go on to their website, they actually have, the, the, the art component of Extinction Rebellion is a really strong part of their, of their message. If you go on to their website, they have all these absolutely beautiful posters that you can download for free. Print, and anybody can print them. The only thing is you can't profit from them, even fundraising. Um, so here are some of here are some of theirs. Uh, Extinction Rebellion sort of emerged out of Rising Up, which promotes a fundamental change of sort of political and economic systems, um, and they they really talk about maximizing well-being and minimizing harm. Um, the fact that change needs to be nurtured in a culture of reverence, gratitude, and inclusion um, is, is sort of their, their motto. And I, I think their, their graphics are just incredibly um, wow. strong. Um, I wanted to show, so on October 9th, as Turkey was going to Syria, this was one of the um, largest Extinction Rebellion protests um, in London, you can see that the part of Extinction Rebellion is this group called the, the Red Brigade. And one of my students' mothers is in it, which is so, uh, <laughs> that's how I found out about it. And you can see them really using um, uh, the, the sort of the costumes and gestures of sort of Greek tragedy. They're very, it's very beautiful, it's very haunting. Um, these are the three core demands of, of Extinction Rebellion. Governments must tell the truth about climate change, we've got to reduce carbon emissions to zero by 2025, and the creations of a citizens' assembly to oversee progress. And I'd love to hear other people in this room talk about the history and notion of citizens' assemblies, if we have time. Um, they also uh, create these, these um, these border blocks, these blocks, and you can see the police even sort of on them. And, uh, and one of the things that's really interesting to me is that when we talk about the theater, what, what can fascinate people? You know, what, what, what has the appeal, what attracts the way violence um, uh, attracts? Um, I think that this, this coming to get some of, I think that, that, that Extinction Rebellion um, does uh, attract, and one of the things is, uh, that's interesting to me is that they are um, they're working in, uh, even though these are acts of civil disobedience, the, you know, they're in cahoots with the police, the Museum of Natural History, and all of these different cultural organizations, um, museums, <laughs> um, to, to make peaceful protests. So, Sorry about that. So the latest weapons developments indicate a high acceptance of violence, as Professor O'Connell has many examples of militarized peacekeeping and armed intervention chronicle. On the current state of dispute resolution, she writes that parties to conflict, quote, often show more confidence in their ability to use military force than to gauge in direct negotiation. The attitude is irrational. In the case after case from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe, the facts of history and military science direct parties away from the use of military force. Rational facts are plainly not enough to overcome what Andrew Basevich has called the infatuation with the military. The acceptance of violence is linked to the rejection of ever losing. This passage has made me very conscious of a couple of the guiding intuitions that have shaped the guest book project. A creative peace initiative founded and directed by Professor <coughs> Richard Carney, a wonderful professor at BC who's here and I see he's been taking lots of notes so I hope he'll pipe up during uh, question and answer. And for a number of years, um, I've been involved with guest book project and we've focused on exchanging narratives as a way of overcoming conflict. And I'm gonna let you see um, this video. In most European languages, the word for guest and for enemy is the same. 
I set up the Guestbook project based on the theme of hosting the stranger. What we're trying to do with Guestbook at the moment is to extend the project to a more global initiative where we invite young people from different sides of divided cities and communities to try to understand how hospitality can take place. Young people can engage in a work of creative imagination by making little movies in two stages. The first where they tell their respective story and then in a second movement they reinvent a new story where the old cycle of violence is overcome with a new story. These uniforms label us as being different. But what if we combine them? The effort of this being to encourage them to tell their stories and then make that impossible leap of hospitality, faith, trust and imagination in the possibility of something new. So with Guestbook, um, and I'll try to get out of here, we, um, we uh, as we say, we bring together youths in divided communities um, to exchange stories. And then the thing that's really the, the part that I care about desperately, too, is then create a third thing. Um, one of the intuitions of Guestbook is if you want people to have confidence in something other than violence, that you have to give them alternative opportunities. Ideally, young people should have as many opportunities for practicing cooperation and creation and making as they currently have for competition, destruction, and violence. Confidence in military force may not be all that irrational if you don't have anything else in your experiential toolbox. Guestbook brings together youths and divided communities to exchange stories in the first person and then share in the making of some sort of creative gesture or project. It can be anything, sharing music, making a piece of artwork, trading clothes as a way to work through transgenerational conflict and to practice peacemaking. Um, so because I took so long, I'm going to stop right, right there and then we can move on to some, hopefully have some time to do some, some right. other things, but thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So I think it's uh, um, like almost mean to put me after someone who argues before the Supreme Court and then someone who installs art at the ICA, and now I get to compel you and keep you awake for the last 12 minutes of our talk together. Um, I found it really helpful to hear a little bit of your life story and what shaped your passion um, and, and your sorrow around this. So I wanted just to describe a little bit of my timeline so you can situate me. Um, I started my Masters of Divinity on 9-11. Um, it was the, the day of the towers being hit, and I was enrolled at Harvard Divinity School, and my first class, um, one was on the, the use of force, moral and ethical considerations with Brian J. Hare. Another was Christianity and Democracy with Cornell West. Um, and the year that I finished my MDiv, I was taking a seminar with Michael Ignatieff on sovereignty and intervention. And it was a room full of international students telling him it was a terrible idea to invade and his trying to convince them it was the only way to protect human rights. Um, and I remember uh, yeah, thinking of, um, of shock and awe as the name that as was given to that Baghdad attack and the, the aestheticizing of it. Um, my PhD is in religious studies and it was a way that I could keep asking questions about ethics uh, as they merged into history and think about communities of practice. And one of the areas of Hannah Arendt's thought that's seldom studied but is very poignant for me it, uh, are her personal letters back to Carl Jaspers when she's learning about the camps. And she's, she's in such agony that she's saying the worst thing you can do to these criminals is to hang them, to kill them, and they would have died anyway. So there's something there about a personal mourning of the death of God that really strikes me in its pathos there. Um, so those are some of the backgrounds from which I come um, to, your, to your fine book. And I wanted to describe some of the key teachings that I took from your research and writing. So I took as your main, um, the challenge that you took on. Your challenge was how we can persuade leaders and citizens of states to value law compliance because it is the right thing to do regardless of gain or privilege. 
And you propose that the answer is to turn to legal alternatives to unlawful violence. The norm of use kogans and a strict interpretation of this principle to avoid derogation. You propose that the whole body of international law is structured to move toward eliminating war. So you know it's bold. I admire the boldness. And you say that as you address this challenge, your first proposition is that a persuasive theory of international law for peace must include natural law, positive law, and process law components. And the reason natural law must or, or could be part of this conversation is that natural law, or whether it's a substitutory move, as you suggest, toward aesthetics, quote, explains why consent-based positive law binds, what the moral limits of positive rules are, and how the general principles needed to maintain fairness function. So you're very forthright in setting out your bold proposal in acknowledging the need for um, a transcendental to, to bind us together. And you're also very honest about our historical moment in which first principles and universals have lost their grip for many, especially in public life. Um, and you acknowledge that the law of a community must be accessible to people of all faiths and to none. So there, again, I heard something of John Rawls in that also, the fact of reasonable pluralism. It's not an opinion, it's now a fact. Um, one of the concerns that you describe is that uh, coercion becomes the only tool by which we um, subsume, sort of submit ourselves to law. And I think that's quite true. There's no longer an operating principle of the common good for most of us. And there becomes increasing skepticism of self-interest, of being regulated as a biopolitical body that uh, I see in my students, uh, in the next generation even more than in mine. I was born in 1974. The governance is understood to be a project of shoring up current arrangements and that ideology is used, even ideology of freedom, to produce docile bodies so that power, capital, can move with less and less friction. So as you begin to look towards what can be holding this binding force, you're not looking to reveal truth. You're not looking to the consistency of reason although Plato and Augustine and Aquinas do interest you. But you propose that, quote, aesthetic philosophy reveals that contemplation of beauty and the experience of pleasure it generates is a universal experience. So through the study of beauty, we might return to natural law and shore up the art of law. Now, one of the, uh, the questions that I wanted to uh, think about with you if we have time afterwards is the distinction between beauty and truth that of course Kant makes and your preference um, and the preference of others in the study of aesthetics towards beauty in this case. You say the study of beauty reveals the human attraction to social harmony, order, equality, and proportion over disharmony, privilege, asymmetry, and violence. These insights revitalize natural law with its higher norms and principles of fairness. They support a robust rule against the use of force. And I can appreciate why the sublime is not the right resource for you. When we think about shock and awe, you, there's been such a glamorization, such a sort of heightened aesthetic around, um, around sovereignty. Um, and that was something that distressed Hannah Arendt also about the Nazis, was how beautiful they made themselves and how uh, Hitler became a compelling site, and part of her philosophy is an attempt to decenter the criminal. I also think that you're absolutely right that the amount of funds that we spend on the promise of greater personal security through the resort to force is uh, morally impossible. We spend funding on military security instead of on education or nutrition. And I do see in my students uh, the tendency to champion that even responsibility to protect the militarization of a humanitarian intervention 
is one that my students want to open up to greater and greater possibilities. So they share your diagnoses around uh, what they can call ecocide, the destruction of, say, the Brazilian rainforest. Um, or uh, they seek to broaden the, um, the mandate to protect heritage, to protecting also religious sites, such as the giant Buddhas that were destroyed um, in Afghanistan. So their instinct becomes again and again to securitize. And I think that's wonderful to hear about these other experiments with teaching students both to appreciate finitude, negotiation as idiosyncratic, and the impossibility of total realization of justice. In some ways, it's learning a vulnerability and a humility. So I agree entirely with this premise that mindsets must change in order to shore up standing for the law. And with your statement that ideas that recapture the imagination for peace can help support this understanding, this new imaginary. And I'm, I'm proud to share that um, I just had a book that I co-edited come out this month on Toni Morrison and uh, the moral imagination and reading goodness into her works as a kind of moral instruction that works on the reader. And I think it's especially admirable in her context because she's very forthright about the violence that's been undertaken. The, the, what is asked to, to have a habituated goodness in the African American community when there's so much reason for resentment and rage. Um, so some of the questions that I wanted to, um, to share, having read this very compelling um, book, was to think about why we put beauty before us to inspire us to law and not the suffering of injustice. And the case that I was thinking of is the enormous Guernica that's at the United Nations Security Council. And I'm thinking of the moment when the, uh, the second Bush administration hung um, blue tarps over that um, artistic production when they were pitching their Iraq invasion as morally necessary. There was something in that performance that showed it was too threatening to consider the horrors of war and that that was a kind of witness to the need for international law. Um, I'm not entirely, I love Yeats, um, I love to hear poetry, but I am not quite ready to go into the, the beauty and truth relationship um, and part of my question there comes from a different part of my work, um, which is around gender theory and feminist concerns. That you mentioned justice as a woman holding the two scales. And then I wonder if we let in, how much when we begin to talk again about natural law and talk about order and talk about grace and symmetry, are we evoking standards of, of whiteness um, or evoking claims about natural law that are heteronormative and that are about gender complementarity. I also am thinking about the question of theology without beauty and about the work of the crucifix that stands um, demanding to be contemplated as a moment not of glory, but of suffering and humiliation. Um, and a final question that I um, am interested in talking about is, is that while you, um, you do your work well about talking about international law as a structure that moves towards eliminating war, whether the international law of the UN Charter and others like it are sufficient, sufficient for thinking about justice as well as peace. So we think about challenges such as climate change, about violent border regimes, about wealth disparities, these are um, the emergence of new concerns that John Locke did not allow for. And it's possible that when we have the brain power in this room to think about the resources of law that could be remade to address them. But they're not currently institutionalized in the same way that the nation state and the sovereign nation state is institutionalized. Um, so if we have more chance for a discussion, I'd be in interested in talking a little bit more about that crooked timber of humanity mm -hmm. from which nothing is made straight, <laughs> about Augustine and the theological anthropology of us as fallen, whether that's something that a story we tell ourselves to our detriment, whether we could tell other stories about uh, human um, penchants for good um, or for greed, and to think about artistic projects um, like uh, uh, the, that, could, that can call us out around climate change, that can call us out around um, refugees and migrant crises, um, where we're forced to look at um, 
the discomfort that we like to separate from ourselves, but that are put before us as demands for justice. Thank you very much. Thank you.